Good evening. My name is Jesse Rosenthal. I am the owner of DCReferees.com and an assigner in Northern Virginia. And I am thrilled to welcome all of you to tonight's Zoom session. And we're going to be talking about advantage from the perspective of how we can use it in risk versus rewards officiating. With me tonight, we were supposed to have Vince DiNardo and he has a medical issue. So it's going to be Kevin Nicholson from West Virginia and I enjoying ourselves with all of you. I will say at the outset that all of our participants tonight are providing personal opinions only. None of us are speaking on behalf of US soccer or for any state referee committee. We're just having a discussion and we're pleased to welcome all of you to participate in it. If you have a question, please put it in the chat. If we don't get to the question in the chat, please feel free to unmute and ask. We want to make sure that this is a vibrant discussion and a good use of your time. Tonight, we're going to be walking through on the definitions of advantage, taking out some field locations and tactical views, addressing some typical and untypical, atypical rather, player management concerns, risk management and a free flying untrammeled q a a little bit about kevin nicholson he is the west virginia state director of assignment he is a newly minted ussf referee coach and an isoa national referee an isoa referee I am an assigner in Northern Virginia, D.C. metro area. I assign both youth and adult matches. I am a former USSF instructor. With that, we're going to start out with defining advantage, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Kevin Nicholson. Kevin? All right. Welcome, everybody, tonight. We hope to have a really good discussion here about one of the finer points of officiating, especially as you move up in advancement and level of games that you're doing, the ability to apply advantage correctly becomes very, very important to how you manage a game and how the game flows. So let's start by a definition of advantage from straight from the IFAB laws of the game. The referee allows play to continue when an offense occurs and the non-offending team will benefit from the advantage and penalizes the offense if the anticipated advantage does not ensue at the time or within a few seconds after applying it. In short, if the referee plays the advantage for an offense for which a caution or send-off would have been issued had play been stopped, this caution send-off may be issued when the ball is out of play next, except for the denial of goal scoring opportunity when the player is cautioned for unsporting behavior. An advantage should not be applied in situations involving serious foul play, violent conduct, or a second cautionable offense unless there's a clear opportunity to score a goal. The referee must send off the player when the ball is next out of play, but the player plays the ball or challenges or interferes with the opponent, then the referee can stop the play, send the player off, and restart with an indirect for quick unless the player committed a more serious offense. Now, those are your standard boilerplate definitions of what advantage is. We're going to go forward and talk about how do we practically apply that law as referees in a game. First thing is calculating, calculating an advantage. There we teach the 4P criteria. In fact, in the referee coach class I was in this weekend, we spent a good bit of time talking about this, and we use the 4P model. Number one, P, possession. Active and credible control by a player fouled or by a teammate. Without possession, none of the other Ps matter. Let's stop at that for a second. If a player does not maintain possession of the ball, then the other three Ps do not apply. You must call the foul. You must stop the play at that point because without possession, you can't have potential, which is your next P. Potential is a probability of continuing immediate attack or an attempt on goal. Third, players and personnel, the number and skill of the attackers versus the number of skill of the defenders. And the fourth P is proximity, which is distance from goal. Let's stop and look at potential. If a player is, let's say a player is grabbed by the shirt from behind, but maintains possession and continues to drive forward, that signals a probability of continuing immediate attack or an attempt on goal, at which point as a referee, you should allow that immediate attack to continue for the player because you're giving that player the opportunity 
to continue an attack even though they've been fouled. Players and personnel, this lends itself to the number and skill of the attackers versus the number and skills of the defenders. If you have one attacker who gets free and runs into a wall of four defenders with no other attacking players with him, that would signal to me that the potential is probably not there and I should probably start play. So I hope everybody understands that. A one-on-one -on -one situation, a one-on-two, -on wait and see, let's see what happens. But if you got an attacker that's just going to run into a wall of defenders and be dispossessed, call the foul, move on, get out of it. The fourth P, proximity from goal, should be self-explanatory, but we're also going to talk about that in the risk-reward category later. The distance from goal matters. A hard foul at the top of the defending team's penalty area coming out for the defense doesn't really give you a potential for a continuing immediate attack, and you're going to get more bang out of calling that foul than letting green goes. Unless, as we'll discuss in the tactical scenarios later, a defender clearly grabs possession and plays a long ball to a striker. So we'll continue to talk about these as we go. I love Venn diagrams. I love flow charts. <laughs> I'm a salesman. That's where my background comes from. We use these a lot. The advantage consideration decision tree, we've made this very, very, very simple. First question you ask yourself, was there a foul? If there was not a foul, then we continue play. If you determine there was a foul, should advantage be applied? Based on the four Ps below, you should be able to decide should the advantage be played. If your answer is yes, then you continue play. If your answer is no, should the advantage, when you ask yourself, should the advantage be played, then the result is either an indirect or direct free kick. And if there's misconduct, then yes, you address the misconduct. This is an oversimplified way of thinking of it, but the first decision as a referee is, is there a foul? The second is, should there be an advantage? Use your four Ps to decide if there should be an advantage. If there is, you continue to let it go. If not, then you address things the way you normally would in a foul situation. And as always, if there's misconduct, you definitely address the misconduct right away. So what is required of a referee? This gets down to the mechanics and it gets down to the meat of applying advantage. And this is where as a coach, assessor, mentor, as a referee myself, this is where most referees get tripped up. The first thing is patience. Patience, patience, patience. You have recognized that a foul or a challenge has occurred. Now, in order to fulfill those four Ps, recognizing is the first step. You need to wait and see if an advantage materializes. That could be two seconds. That could be three seconds. There's no hard and fast rule for waiting to see if an advantage materializes. If, if and only if that advantage materializes, then you clearly apply the advantage signal. This, from a mechanics point of view, is probably the hardest thing I see from referees. A lot of referees can have the patience to wait and see, but their initial thought, as soon as the foul has occurred and they're going to let play go, is to immediately strongly signal for an advantage. What if that advantage doesn't materialize? And now you have to bring it back for the foul. That's confusing to players and it's not the correct mechanics. Wait and see if, and only if you see that clear advantage materialize, do you then announce play on, advantage, whatever your verbalization is, as well as make the signal. Now think of it this way. As a referee, I see a foul. I wait for things to, to materialize. Then I signal for the advantage. Say, this, say, the, say the striker then gets a shot off, but it's a poor shot. You still have allowed the advantage to happen, and you have signaled that the advantage happened. If you see a challenge that you think you're going to apply advantage for, the player stumbles and immediately loses possession, you've not shown a signal, you've not verbalized anything, you just blow the whistle and call the foul. That makes a much cleaner, much more understandable mechanic and thought process for the players, the spectators, the coaches, everybody involved. So 
wait and see if it if I, if it materializes then show the signal doesn't materialize just call the foul and you single then you know obviously the doesn't materialize you haven't made the signal you haven't made yourself look back you just call the just call the foul and signal for the free kick a tactical evaluation is continued a possession enough to justify disregarding the free kick opportunity. Go back to your four piece. Is the potential for a scoring opportunity greater than the advantage, or greater than the free kick opportunity going to be for the attacking team? So basically, six one after does than the other. If if you feel that. They would be more advantaged by taking the free kick, then call a free kick. But that potential, lean heavily on that potential. You know, is the possession just about disregarding the free kick? What are the foul team's options? If that player gets free after being fouled, does he have a shot? Does he have a player he can play it to? Those are all things we got to think about in potential. And you also got to ask yourself, will the players accept the advantage opportunity? Too many times I hear a player or a coach say, oh, we would have rather had the foul. Well, that's something you have to consider as a referee and you have to hone that through your experiences of when does playing advantage give the team the upper hand versus calling the foul. All right, Jesse. So this is something new. Um, what we've done, and this is a personal preference, is we are not going to be playing any still, any video clips. We're going to be using still images, so that way we're not having to unwind a video and make sure the people have a chance to see it. And I would like to put this in the frame of seeing the field in front of you. So what we have on screen very clearly is a referee signaling advantage the player who is on his knees and near the head is the one who's been fouled. And we have a situation where the attackers are in a position to proceed. And this referee has made the judgment that it's in the fouled team's best interest to proceed with the attack. So recognition and communication is in a position to see it and sell it and be incredible. What we have here is reading the attack. We have the referee in the middle of the field and in the bottom of each of these slides, we have the attacker in black who's got the ball at his feet. He's being pursued by white and he evades the white challenge. And once he does, you can see that in a matter of seconds, 3419 to 3423, all of a sudden the tactical position has changed. And if there is a foul that comes at this point, the referee needs to re-validate and recalculate an advantage decision if in fact that player is fouled. This is the most glorious example that I could find of the value of waiting and seeing. We've got blue 30 on the left hand left hand slide at the point of the attack he's being challenged by the gray defender. Right then you might say okay he's being fouled at the point of the attack, but if we wait and see what happens, we get the image to the right where his teammate is in position to receive the ball if the pass goes through. Let that blue player have the unmolested chance to proceed and attack the goal. And so this also illustrates two larger points, right? Is the point of the attack and the point of the receipt both being important areas for the referee to consider where a foul might come and also where the advantage could materialize. Kevin, anything to add here? No, once again, it's just being able to see the tactical picture clearly and being able to decide what is in the best interest of the attacking team is just 
these were the words I was searching for earlier, uh, the best interest of the attacking team, whether it be to call the foul or to allow the play to go forward. And I should say we're going to use attacking team and foul team somewhat interchangeably, so please just bear with us. Here's another example. A breakaway. We can see that the official is hustling to catch up. White is making a breakaway, and the red team is in hot pursuit. In the bottom right corner, that same attacker, he's now been, whoops. Sorry. That same attacker has been caught by Red 17. Could be a foul, but you got an unmarked white teammate who's sitting right there, effectively one on one with the goalkeeper. The wait and see, because that contact is happening with Red 17 outside the penalty area, it's worth waiting and seeing if the advantage materializes. The key, once again, using the four Ps is potential. What is the greater what is the greater it serves the greater interest of the attacking team a foul right outside of the area or this potential opportunity of a striker that's going to be one on one with the goalkeeper the last point here is this is a good example of something where you may want to come back with a misconduct decision and you want to keep in your brain who the guilty party was so that if a misconduct is warranted, you can come back and make sure that you've tagged Red 17 and not one of his twin teammates, because the last thing you want to do is to caution the wrong player. Now here's another example, and this is a situation where we've got a long ball being played by White against the Red team. So in the top, top image on the left, we've got the point of service, there are no defenders anywhere near where he is, and he's got a whole bunch of options. Where's the possibility of the foul? We're going to go clockwise, and the image on the bottom right shows the ball being received as a header goes up between white and red. If red fouls that white player, okay, that might be a foul worth stopping, but if you wait and see, all of a sudden you've got a unmolested, white attacker just to the left of square of the wing where if even if he is fouled in the act of being of trying to receive the ball that's relayed from a long defender pass and all of a sudden he's gotten a one-on-one -on -one opportunity with the goalkeeper point of service point of receipt this next slide illustrates and this is why i like using stills this this helps to articulate the concept when we talk about potential the probability of continuing immediate attack or an attempt on the ball and we talk about the amount of players the number of skilled attackers versus the number of skilled defenders black striker on the wing out here if number three were to foul him even if he gets away what are his attacking options? Does he have any attacking options in the box? From this slide, you can clearly see that he doesn't. So even if the black attacker would get out of the foul from three, does he have a potential? Does he have players that he can play it to? In this case, I would say neither. So allowing an advantage here would actually be doing a disservice to the attacking team rather than giving them a potential for an immediate attack. Here's another example of the breakaway where we see that black has those numbers, black has unmolested possession. There are really two obvious sources of immediate foul that could arise for a referee to recognize. Maybe red three or red five contests the ball and they try to foul the blip black possessor before he or she gets a chance to release it, or maybe four in red in the center of the screen decides to hold on to his mark and stop him from going forward, which would also impact the attack. Maybe he fouls him, but maybe the black marker for four escapes the, escapes the hold, 
and that's why we want to use the wait and see. Now, you're not going to be on the field seeing these circles on this well manicured piece of green. But when we're attacking with numerical superiority, and again, this is the same circumstance we saw a moment ago, where red is all flat, black has possession, there's attacker almost level with five and four, and we'll see where the ball is going to go. Right now, there's no red contest against the ball, so the potential foul is going to be probably through the through ball, or if he here lays the ball off to the wing, number two in position to foul. And here's that same scenario, but this time with moving players on it. And our referee is in a great position to stay out of the passing lanes, to see the point of contest where the ball is being possessed by the, in the center, as well as if a through ball is played to the red attacker who is making a diagonal run across. So this is something that we alluded to earlier is where is the ball, where is it being played from? Right now we have a situation where we have effectively a bunker situation where blue is in possession and their defensive third. There is no credible attacking opportunity. A lot of players are being tightly marked. And so what's the counter to the bunker? I'm going to play it over the top, right? Or maybe they'll do a tiki-taka and try to pass their way out of it. Oh, they're going the long ball. So four is going to try to distribute the ball to either seven or nine. If the release to seven or nine is successful, all of a sudden they have a, pra a practical, reasonable goal-scoring opportunity. But now orange nine is in a position to attack the point of distribution. We want to have visibility on number nine, challenging number four, as well as with the points of receipt between five and nine in the middle of the field, and blue seven and orange three on the right wing. So let's talk about player management a little bit, because this always comes into our, our decision making when we're trying to decide if there is a potential for an advantage or not. So let's look at foul recognition, number one. Not from a point of is it a foul or is it not a foul, but it's foul recognition. Why do fouls occur in a game? A player and a coach risk reward calculation assumes a different formula, different times of desperation. End of regulation, activation of stoppage time, it's a 1-1 game. The decision to foul or not foul becomes more tantamount to the result of the match. Goal differential impacts advancement in a tournament or a promotion regulation in play. And players who earned earlier cautions no longer walking on eggshells. Basically, once you get into, into regularization or you get into the stoppage time period, players will do things that they wouldn't normally do. So this needs to play into your decision making as a referee about whether you're going to allow an advantage or not. Especially when you get down to the end, we talk about players who have earned earlier cautions i.e. the normal center back who got one in the fifth minute who's been playing like an angel the entire match now does not care if he has a chance to, if he has to make a decision on whether to make a tackle to save the match or not. So the longer you go, the more this plays into your mind about potential and whether there's actually a goal scoring opportunity. I don't know what the teams want to do. You guys could mute yourself oh, or not. Hey, you asking a question. Hey, you Son, uh oh. Did I leave my phone in the car? My phone. Jesse, could you try to mute? Yeah, I'm trying to find it. <laughs> Just when you think things are going smooth. They were. She's gone. Excellent. All right, to the new to the next slide. Talk about five foul recognition, why things occur, teams, wants, and needs. Uh, this is all just playing off the same thing. Sorry. 
the scoring opportunities? Does the free kick improve the odds better than the dynamic play? So that's something you've got to decide once again. Does the potential give is the potential for a scoring opportunity the best advantage of the attacking team or not? Uh, the situation of a defensive team trying to kill the clock. Not every team wants stoppage time. You know, punishment for the transgressor. Does the foul, does the team that is fouled want the possession or the opportunities from a restart set piece? Let's give for an example, an attacking team that is up two to one with you know, 45 seconds of regulation and a, and a situation occurs, a challenge that would be a foul where you may normally want to play an advantage on that foul. Does the team really want the advantage at that point? They're up a goal. They're trying to bleed time. So at that point, it is in the best attention of the attacking team to call the foul. So then they have a restart, set piece. They can waste time within the confines of the laws of the game. Uh, that gives a team more of a service by a lot by calling the foul than allowing the possession. So keep in mind the extracurricular environmental factors of the game, time, score, things of that nature. Once again, think about the score effects. Teams will play differently depending on how far ahead or behind they are at the game. If a team is three goals up, they'll sit back and take more shots against than they would if they were three goals down. Just simple. Think about how the score affects your decision making. Tactical indicators, the scoreboard, bunker defensive positioning, player and coach chatter. You, you'll hear coaches give lots of instruction, especially if they're up. They'll say five touches for sure before shooting, keeping the ball. Um, Engages the ego of the opponent. Uh, look for time king, time wasting by goalkeepers. Race to the corner flag. Excessive substitution. Changes to players from restarts, throwing kicks, free kicks. All of these should give you an idea of what the team is trying to do. The team is trying to waste time. They don't want an advantage decision. Think about the player's motivation. You know, do they want to jump on the bandwagon and score? And the bench players, you want to prove they deserve more playing time, vengeance for taunting, showboating, injury row captain, getting even, descent by foul, and the lovely look at me, Ma, Karen spectators. So all just plays into the tactical picture in your head as a referee, which will help you make decisions about potential. Same thing here, just winning team mindset is protect the lead, avoid unnecessary risk, avoid unnecessary misconduct, don't run up the score. Losing team's mindset, can we still close the gap? Like, is there a prayer? Is there a chance? Should we take more risk going forward? Can we seek retribution without consequences if the outcome is unchangeable? Is the referee biased against us already? They're trying to avoid unnecessary risk of energy and blame division. You got to look for teams that start blaming each other and start arguing between each other. It all just gives you a tactical idea of what's going on. Score impacts on team tactics also, you know, they'll, they'll switch to a bunker defense, try to counterattack out of it, you know, descent by committing a foul, and is a team more possession-centric. Once again, just be aware if there's a blowout, what the winning team is going to try to do, what the losing team is going to try to do, plays into your mind, you know, like like a foul in the defensive third, you get no advantage by you get nothing as a referee, no goodwill by allowing the advantage there. Same thing if you get into a situation like this where you've got a losing team that's just committing a cynical foul. Called foul. Advantage at that point is is negated. If there's a tie score, does a tie let one team advance in the standings? These are things you should be aware of before the game even starts. And then lastly, the impact on the technical area, because we've all been there. We've all heard the coaches that will the coach understand why the advantage is given? Does the coach agree with your decision to give advantage, you know, especially if the team is already ahead two to one? Has the coach demanded a tactical foul to disrupt an attack? Is, is he yelling at little Joey to stop him at all costs? Um, you know, to use a wonderful sweep the leg mentality, um, you know, listen to the things that happen from the sideline. 
I recently had a USL2 match that was a, a grand example of this. The team is up four to one. The losing team with two to three minutes ago, we'd already said on comms we were going to add four minutes because that was a legitimate stoppage time. The fourth official got the, the attention of the referee, came over and told the referee, hey, this losing team over here is telling his players to run through people, to break legs, to get even, things like that. So the referee, 90 minutes goes, blows, for, blows the final whistle, and we get out of dodge. There was no interest in adding time. There was no interest in giving the losing team any other opportunities to create mayhem other than what was already given. So be aware, having fourths is nice. I know we don't always have fourths, but be aware. AR1 is going to hear most of what's going on on the sidelines. They can let you know, call you over, you know, help you make decisions of that nature. Now Jesse's going to talk about risk management. What do we mean by risk? And what I think is helpful here is for us to bring our off the field knowledge and life experience and apply that here on the soccer field. We've all seen it, maybe in banking, whether or not somebody is qualified for a loan. We see it in education, whether or not someone is offered a scholarship or possibly they are offered additional tutoring help because they're struggling. And in soccer, we're going to see that on the soccer field with the determination as to whether or not that foul must be called, because if we don't, all hell is about to break loose. Or if the players can handle the application of advantage without losing our control of the match. So risks can be accepted if we know that the cost of mitigation is higher than the impact. You can avoid the risk with a prevention strategy and elevating the amount of communication you're doing as the referee and the ARs with the players on the field. You can transfer risks and shift the risk to another actor, or you can just mitigate it by taking additional steps to head off adverse outcomes. And so this is the crux of a risk versus a reward decision. I may take the risk of applying the advantage, but if allowing play to proceed, maybe back at the point of the foul, there's a retaliation because he doesn't see his teammate about to receive the ball and having a decent chance on goal. So we wanna make sure that the four P criteria are present. We also wanna see and try to put ourselves in the brains and in the cleats of the foul team as to whether or not they'd really prefer to have possession continue versus the free kick, which allows for people to get their heads back in the, back on their nets. We also want to understand that it becomes a more complicated decision when there's a yellow card that's going to come. As referees, we want to think immediately about whether or not something is going to get yellow card level attention and announce this decision. Not with a public address system, but you can say number 16 will be back to talk about this. And that gives the other members of the team an opportunity to understand that you've seen the foul. You're not going to let it go, but there's an advantage you're allowing to proceed. And that also allows you to engage with your ARs to help find the miscreant. And if you say to yourself mentally, well, who is the person who did that? Maybe you get their number. Maybe it was the kid with the blonde hair. Maybe it was the girl with the ponytail. So that way you can find him or her back when you need to after the attacking opportunity has come and the misconduct is dealt with. Also recommend thinking, is this foul a key match incident? Is it likely to elevate the temperature of the match? And that will dictate how promptly you want to deal with it. If I could interject in just a second, Jesse. Please. The importance of addressing the misconduct, even if you play the advantage, is huge. Because you can't allow the advantage. And then, as Jesse just said, you can come back to enforce the misconduct. 
Just because you allow an advantage doesn't mean the offending player gets off scot-free. You have to understand as a referee, as you all know, if you don't protect the players, if you don't dispense justice, then they're likely to dispense it themselves. Because in the mindset of a player, oh, yeah, you allowed advantage, but I still got cleated in the leg. What are you going to do about it, Mr. Referee? If you do nothing, that is not going to help your game control very much at all. So as you're concentrating on the challenge, as you should be as a referee, and you're allowing that, that advantage to go forward, make sure, as Jesse said, you're figuring out who the offending player is. Especially if I'm in close proximity to my AR1, I'm verbally, 16, 16, we're coming back. That gives me a cue. It also gives my AR a cue as well to help me out with that decision. But it could be kid in the green cleats. It could be a number of things if you don't get the number right away. But being that you're concentrating on that challenge, you should have an idea who the player is. This is another tool that I am repurposing from civilian life. And what I like about it is there's a map between likelihood and consequence. As the attacking opportunities likelihood increase, we get closer to a goal, which is in the bottom left-hand corner of the chart. If the likelihood of a goal is lower, which is our level one, and the consequences, like if we have serious foul player violent conduct, that's the upper right-hand side in the red area. And that gigantic swath of yellow going diagonally from top left to lower right is a gigantic gray area. I would like to stress that advantage is not a science. It is inherently subjective. There are professional referees who don't give the advantage. And in the clips, we have examples of them, which I'm not going to play today, where the advantage is not given. And we're kicking ourselves literally because there's a glorious goal scoring opportunity, but we couldn't see it. And so there is both ambiguity about what the next cause is. But also, this should give you a mindset for, is this really going to be a goal-scoring opportunity? If not, see and weigh the advantage, but make sure that you're ready to deal with any misconduct if it flares up. So the final reflection point that I have for this presentation is never, ever, ever risk your overall match control for application of an advantage. If you've got violent conduct, if you've got serious foul play, if you've got mass confrontation erupting behind the ball, hi, deal with it. Those are the things that are going to make the rest of the match, advantage or no advantage, be an absolute nightmare for whatever time you have left. And remember, our primary concern on the field safety first, not the score being favoring one team or another. So I put up in the um, chat before we started tonight, a list of a whole list of additional resources and reading and videos on Advantage from a lot of different sources. Um, I want to make sure that I'm crediting Kyle Dykstra, who provided a very, very cogent, easy to comprehend breakdown of different team tactics, in addition to the traditional referee resources that I've highlighted here. And I'll go ahead and repost that this list in the chat so that people can use it. I don't think that Zoom is very good at handling video, so I'm not going to try. I'm going to go ahead and throw the the um, 
discussion open to questions. I, I have a question. Shoot. Um, if you allow for advantage inside the 18 and the attacking player who was fouled shoots and misses, can you blow the whistle for a PK? Ask yourself the four Ps. Was there an attacking potential? Did the attacking potential materialize? If so, then no. If you're allowing, you, you can't let a striker off the hook. You know, if you're going to allow them to play for it and take the shot, then you have allowed the advantage. You have done your job. Okay. Convert on the advantage or not is not your problem. Okay. So in, in, I can think of several circumstances. One, if, if the player who was fast still on the ball and takes a legitimate shot and it goes wide. Okay. But what if that player was fouled is off balance and just sort of toe pokes it as a shot going down, falling, falling to the ground and it goes wide. Did Are there any it? circumstances in which you would blow the whistle for a PK or Absolutely. not? Absolutely. But that comes down to a judgment call back to potential. When you talk about those four okay. teams, you obviously still have potential, but is the potential to score more advantageous than the penalty kick? And, okay. and just depend on a case by case scenario. I got you. Okay. I understand if, that. If you're saying if the player is in the act of going down, probably he would rather have a PK. <laughs> but once okay. again, you can wait and see for a second. Okay. What I'm saying is don't, if the foul absolutely affects the ability to get the shot off, then you're better off going with the, okay. penalty, with the penalty kick. But if you, if, they, if you allow the advantage to get a clean shot and they miss and they go, okay, I'll take the foul ref. No, I'm sorry. That's a very good question though. Okay. And one last question. Thank you. You said there is no time lapse uh, in which you can no longer blow the whistle for uh, for a foul. In other words, when you when you apply advantage, you don't have to give like two, three, four seconds before you either let it go or blow the whistle. Is that what you said? I'm saying according to the laws of the game, there is not. Okay. As a practical manage, as a practical idea, what can you sell as a referee? Right. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's why there's no hard or fast rule there. Yeah, gotcha. I've heard people say six seconds. I've heard people say four seconds. I've heard no. It's and that comes down to you when you give the signal for advantage. Because if you're still waiting for it to materialize, and it doesn't, blow the whistle and call the foul. But okay. once you've given that signal that you're allowing the advantage, you cannot bring it back at that point. Okay. Because from a Thank practical you. point of view, you have allowed the advantage. Whatever else happens, happens. Now, I will give you, maybe this will help you understand as well. Say you had an...
Me as a referee myself, if, if I had to go to five or six seconds, then I'm not made the correct decision myself. Um, are there situations that happens? Yeah. You know, one of my favorite mechanics that I see a lot of referees do now is they'll see a situation and they'll, they'll recognize that they aren't going to call this, but they'll point to the ball or they'll point to the spot like, hey, I saw it, but I'm not calling that a foul. You know, that's just a mechanic that, it's not necessarily taught, but it's something I've picked up from a lot of higher level referees just to show that, hey, I did see that challenge and I don't think it was a foul. But be clear, be decisive as you can be and make a decision as quickly as you can.
Because let's face it, most of these challenges, whether they're deciding if there's going to be an advantage or not, happen pretty quick. You know, it's either a tackle or a grab or, you know, a, a charge or something like that, that pretty quickly you're going to recognize whether that attacking player is able to gain possession of the ball and continue forward. Once again, not to oversimplify it, but go back to those four Ps. Does the player maintain possession? Does he have the potential to attack? And then the other two follow along with that. But you should be able to recognize and pretty pretty clearly make a judgment, not not let it go five to six seconds. I don't know if that answers your question or makes any sense, but you know, just polish your decision making ability. Because yes, the longer you wait, the longer you're going to be criticized for being indecisive. Thanks, Kevin. I'm back on also now. I just can't see the questions in the chat. <laughs> hey, Kevin, I have a question for you. This is sure. George. Yeah. So sometimes I, I, I develop this habit of vocalizing to players, keep playing, keep playing to see what's going to happen. And when I'm, and when I realize whether I can call the advantage or not, then I signalize so everybody can see it. Do you think that's a good, it, do you think that helps in the mechanics or maybe you can confuse even more if I keep saying keep playing, keep playing, and then I call the fall and bring the ball back to this part of the fall? That's an excellent question, George. And I've got my answer to the whole thing is I have no problem when you verbalize things. I think that's very useful for player management. What I would caution you on is your is your wording and what vocabulary you are using. I, as a referee, try to reserve the words play and advantage to play on or I'm giving an advantage. If you maybe change your words, say keep going, keep going, keep going, or we're going, we're going, or you know, continue, continue, continue. I think that's excellent because that does communicate to the players what your mindset and thinking is. But I would just say be cautious about using the word play unless you're using it in an advantage context. So maybe I can say something like, I saw it, keep playing, or no, I saw exactly. it, keep playing. Okay. Exactly, exactly. And, and I tend to default to the word going just to avoid using the word play. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a horrible sin if you use the word play. Just understand that that might confuse the players at a later date if you're using the word play on for advantage. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Kevin, I'm going to jump in also. And the only thing that I would add is don't be a distraction. If after every challenge you're saying, keep going, keep going, keep going, the players are going to turn and look at you and say, yeah, we know. How did we know? You didn't blow the whistle. Oh, okay. And so every time that you're speaking in that context, you want to make sure that you're giving people some information that they didn't have. Foul, no foul. Foul, but you're waiting, just wait and seeing what you can do. If you're speaking in a way of trying to keep people's focus on the ball, don't turn the spotlight on yourself at that cost, if that helps. Yes, thank you, Justin. Excellent. More questions. Hey, Kevin, this is JR. I've got a question for you. Yeah, JR. So how would you, how would you describe the uh, sort of ability or expectation of an assistant referee in regards to advantage? That's a great question. Are you, are you referring to how you communicate that to the assistant referee or are you referring to the assistant referee allowing advantage to happen. Yeah, that's what I'm really talking about. Yeah, so, so what, how, how would or even should uh, an assistant referee uh, either try to communicate uh, to the players or to uh, the referee uh, that this is a situation where advantage can or should be applied? It's an excellent question. And it's actually a, an open debate right now as far as how as an AR do you do that? Because there is no mechanic for an AR to allow advantage per se. 
you know, you don't have the ability like the referee to extend your arms or, or anything like that. What I was saying, I'm going to ask Nick Brown, if he'll, if he'll chime in with this too, because he's probably more up to date on the teaching as far as that goes than even I am. But what I have heard more than anything is to verbalize as an AR. You know, if you're, if you're going to allow that to happen, you know, the same thing that George just talked about, keep going, keep going, keep going, you know, play through it, work, work through it. As Linda just said, work it out, work it out. You know, arms, arms, if you want to drop their arms, just your normal communication. Uh, to me, as an AR, you're, the way you communicate as the referee is you just don't stop and, wait and raise your flag. I mean, that seems like a simplistic answer. But to, to me, that's the only way that the assistant referee can communicate advantage. Are you still on, Nick Rod? may not be. Uh, he is currently off. Yeah. Jesse, I don't know if you've got anything to add on that about how, how an AR would communicate um, advantage. Um, well, you can't say the words play on. But the ARs have just as much authority to call a foul as the center referee. And so you use your flag as your whistle, correct? So in that case, if you see something that looks like a foul, the AR should also be applying his or her judgment in the wait and see before you signal the foul if it's within your quadrant. What we don't want to do is have a situation where the AR is obviously they had a good pregame discussion about this where the AR is making a foul or no foul decision in a way that is more properly in the center referee's office and jumping in before while the referee is still having a wait and see and evaluation point. You don't want to have that kind of discord between the center referee and the AR. And the way to make sure that that doesn't happen is to communicate about how much assistance to give and where on the field the AR is going to be increasing his assistance or her assistance to support the team concept, if that makes sense. I think that's good, uh, good advice. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and I think there's a, a sort of another scenario where this happens sometimes, but I, I wouldn't necessarily call it advantage, but it's sort of like advantage uh, in the sense where, you know, particularly in the younger age groups where they can punt the ball a heck of a lot further, they can uh, do a free kick where instead of signaling for offside, you know, you might allow that play to continue for the goalkeeper to get it, uh, where, you know, they might be able to punt or distribute as opposed to, having a formal restart and, and it's one of those things that you know we communicated uh you know as a team you know before the whistle begins uh but there seems like there's an opportunity to do that by not signaling uh for offside right and, you know that's absolutely comes back to the whole wait and see phenomenon uh just to bring up a, a different example of that what was brought up this weekend when we were all talking uh, at the class was someone asked the question, can you play advantage on the handball? Well, the correct answer is no, by the laws. But you can choose not to call a handball. So you're doing the same thing, just don't show an you don't show a signal or say advantage or something like that on a handball, on a handball defense. Just allow play to continue. Hey, I'm sorry, Kevin, why is that? It's just not in the laws. Or the uh, but it's not, not in the law. I mean, it doesn't say that you may not play advantage on, on handball either. So, and it seems to me if I've got a handball situation, back to some of the drawings that you had, you know, balls coming through and, and you know, there's a handball situation by the defender, but the ball is now going, you know, to my, uh, to the attacking uh, player and it's going to put them into a goal scoring opportunity why wouldn't you play advantage and give them that opportunity yeah and it's it's a reasonable question and all i can tell you is from the teachings that i've been privy to 
they have always they they've always said not to show an advantage decision on a handbook. I don't, however, have it in writing to be able to point to it. So that's more of my opinion, what I've seen, what I've been taught. So well, and I, I think the last one I have about it, I appreciate you sharing that, is when they've changed the, the sort of the or provided more clarity around when the ball is deliberately played and when it's a deflection. Mm -hmm. One of the examples they give is handball, <laughs> and they talk about the fact that uh, when the defender handles the ball, it in fact represents that the ball is being deliberately played. Mm -hmm. uh, so that sort of implies to me that play should continue, and a player in, say, an offside position uh, would be reset from an offside perspective and would likely have advantage since they're behind uh, the defensive line there, and you should allow advantage. Uh, for them to have a chance to score right and i'm not arguing that you shouldn't allow it my only argument is from a mechanics point of view as a referee you should not signal the an advantage at that point you're just allowing it to happen i think that we're splitting very very hairs that are being yeah. split very very narrowly it's and it's confusing. And so, I, JR, I think the point that I would make, and hopefully this isn't contradicting Kevin, is is this something that is a foul as opposed to an infringement? If it is a foul, you can consider whether or not stopping play for the foul is in the interest of the team that was fouled. And how you recognize and deal with it, there's some wiggle room with how you communicate that to the teams. And this may be one of those once in a blooming situations where the team that handled the ball wants you to stop the play because it destroys the advantage. Right? And all of a sudden, it's to their advantage. For you to make the call and blow your whistle, even if it doesn't really, other it's the it would be highly unusual, but I've seen it happen. And so that falls into the rubric of match control and what you're getting for it and how it helps the game and helps the players. Manny commented that he liked the, the four Ps, which I hope if you take away anything from that, that gives you just a quick little mnemonic mental cue uh, of things to think about when allowing advantage or not. That is not our construction, by the way. That is U.S. soccer instruction. Yes. Yes. Good, Good to clarify that. More questions? No? Okay. You guys have my contact information on the slide deck. Uh, Jesse's going to go over it. He'll make it available. Uh, he'll also make it available on YouTube, which he'll go over. But feel free. If you guys have any additional questions, shoot me an email. I'll find a way to answer them or connect with you. Or if I don't know the answer, I will get the answer for you. And if for some reason you can't get a hold of Kevin, you can get a hold of me and we'll fix it that way. Absolutely. Well, fantastic. I want to thank everyone for your patience tonight. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but hopefully this was a good use of your time. And we're going to plan another one of these sessions within the next two to three weeks with a fresh panel of uh, experienced senior officials that we can help advance our ability to manage the game and become even better officials. Big thanks to Kevin. Uh, big thank you to Vince DiNardo. Uh, thank you to Nick Rodfada. And thank you to all for making time available in your schedules. And have a great night. Hey guys, thank Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.
Recording in progress. Recording stopped. Please leave your message for This is the weirdest damn thing ever. Huh? This is the weirdest damn thing ever. All right. My screen is showing you is still talking. It says I'm still sharing the screen. My cursor is not locked. It's moving. <laughs> I, I'm just at a complete loss. Well, tell me we got it all on video because I think it went really well. <laughs> I think it went really well too, but I'm afraid to just do a hard shutdown of the computer and then have the recording get scotched. Well, the recording ended when you dropped out. Like it popped up on the screen and said the recording was over when you dropped out. Well, that's so, bad. I don't know where it went, but. Well, I'm willing and able to go call Zoom tomorrow and saying, the hell? Yeah. But I want my recording. Thank you very much. I think it was just a really good presentation tonight. Yeah, not to toot my own horn, but I think it would have actually went really well, just the two of us. Even. Oh, toot away, Kevin. Honestly, it would have been horrible without you. <laughs> well, I'm not always the greatest on Zoom, but you know granted that's one of the things we worked on this weekend with referee coach class was presentation skills and stuff like that so you know it might have actually done some good well i'm kind of, i'm very comfortable on powerpoint I, I don't know if that comes across at all yeah no it does no the slides are excellent man and that's why i struggle is putting together content i can present the hell out of stuff but putting together content is not my not my forte well, the content I can do all day long, but I'm just sitting here waiting for an angry email from my SRC saying, how dare you? Eh, well, that's over it. And now you have a certified licensed referee coach presenting, so. Well, that's not why I like being friends with you. I'm just like. No, I know that. <laughs> I'm just saying that. This lends an extra layer of credibility. Not that it's needed. I don't need any credibility. I mean, if, <laughs> I mean, the person who I silenced was a referee from Ohio. Oh, yeah. 
um, we had people on tonight from Maryland, New York, Virginia, West Virginia, um, California, Texas, and that was all that I remember, recollected while I was fighting my little computer you battle. West Virginia. You. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Once you have the YouTube link up, though, I'm going to put it on the West Virginia Facebook page. So, should put it up anyway. <laughs> 